Nefarious is a movie that was released last month in national theaters. Uh, it had limited amounts from my understanding. I think it was over a thousand to begin with, and then it began to decrease. It is based on a book that was written several years ago by an author that is a professing Christian. And he uh, tells in some interviews that he's done currently about how this idea came to be, which I'll share a little bit of that today. And I want to talk about this movie, and the reason is for a, a couple of reasons, and there are some concerns that I have uh, that I had that have come to light as I've looked into this movie. Um, obviously, it deals with demonic possession. If you're familiar with this movie, and and seen the trailers, or maybe you've even seen it, but there's a lot of talk that I've heard uh, both from people that are very much proponents and adamant about deliverance ministry that are um, promoting this movie. And there are others that are promoting it in the sense of it, that it acknowledges the evil that's going on when you're just looking at America. Because, again, we'll talk about some of this as we go today about the synopsis, the, the premise of the book, and, and what the focus of it is. But there are some true things that are stated here about the current state of our culture. Having said that, there are some concerns with the making of this movie and what I believe are some underlying tones underlying calls in their underlying teachings that are problematic. And so I, with that, I wanted to discuss this today to shed some light on some things that you may or may not be aware of, as I did some research regarding the making of this movie, not the book itself, but the making of it, the movie, and to look and see what's going on here. And I hope that you'll listen to some of the concerns I have and that you'll weigh them for yourselves, that you're, uh, as always, you'll go back to the Word of God go back to what we know to be the truth based on what scripture says, which is the final authority for us as believers in Christ, and to acknowledge that there are some some concerns here. So stick with me as we take a look at Nefarious and some of the things that you may or may not be aware of regarding the making of this film. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. Well, I hope that you're doing well. I am going to be playing quite a few clips today regarding this subject. They're going to be short clips, but there's a lot of information that I looked into when I was researching this topic. Now, Again, you may not be familiar with this, but if you are, then you, you may already know some details about this. Maybe you've listened to some interviews from the directors, uh, the author of the book himself, and, and seen some things, and maybe you have some questions or concerns as well. Maybe you agree with the things that are said in this movie. Maybe you disagree with them. I don't know where you stand on it. It's safe to say that given the cultural climate in the United States alone, and I'm sure that we can see this in other areas of the world, that there are things said that are going to bear witness with with what the movie is stating. At the same time, there is the claim to um, the the spiritual aspect of this that you may not be aware of. And so I want to just shed some light on that and, again, get you thinking about it. Steve Dace is the man who wrote the book Nefarious Plot. And I want to talk a little about, about this first and play a clip for you so you can kind of hear uh, where the book came from or the first idea dropped for him for that and and go from there. I just want to read to you what the back of the cover would say for this book and describing it. It says Republican versus Democrat, the haves versus the have nots, left versus right, us versus them. We believe these are the divisions that are threatening to tear America apart. But what if the culprit isn't a political ideology or a class of people, but a puppet master? He's been manipulating us for centuries, and now he's brought us to the brink of implosion. It would take a special kind of sinister to hatch such a nefarious plot against our civilization. Who or what would be capable of such a conspiracy? All there is to go on is the cryptic message, you'll never guess my name. Steve Dace has said that this book is based on a modern version, if you will, of the screw tape letters. So if you're not familiar with the screw tape letters, that was a book written by C.S. Lewis. And so this is a more modern version of that. Now, I want to play this interview real quick, and then we'll, we'll move on more so to the actual film itself. And again, I'm going to share a lot of clips today, so just hang with me. And at the end, I'm going to share some clips with you um, in, in support of my concerns, the reason why I have concerns. So let's hear this clip real quick. It's from an interview that he recently did with Mark Driscoll regarding this film. And I want you to hear from Steve, D Steve Dace himself as to where the idea for this uh, book first started. Is, 
it's a christian ish film mm -hmm. so like uh you know there's not like a dove or an invitation to pray a cheesy the conversion scene. The I literally put that in my contract. If I was going to sell them the movie yeah. rights, they could not put a cheesy conversion scene in the film. But yeah. no, yeah, no. And so maybe tell folks kind of your heart, the intention, the storyline. And then I want to talk about kind of the, as Christians, the theology behind it, because I'm going to back you up mm -hmm. that it's accurate. Well, I was in Washington, D.C., getting ready to do publicity for the first uh, wide release book I ever published. And I'm in the shower, man. And this voice in the back of my head says to me, this book is dedicated to all the useful idiots out there, especially those of you who had no idea that you were being used all this time for you proved to be the most useful idiots of them all nefarious. And I thought that's odd. OK, and uh, I went. I, and did my p uh, publicity stuff i get back so that's to, where it started yes you think a demon spoke to you in the shower i don't I, I hope not i hope not okay but i get back to my room and i just start playing around with this and i come up with the idea or maybe it's inspired let's take the screw tape letters to another level mm -hmm. instead of instead of you know taking us uh, you know behind the veil of the temptation of individuals what about a demonic takedown of an entire culture and so I created this character, um, a high lord of hell named Lord Nefarious, who was tasked by the devil over 100 years ago with the destruction of the United States of America. And in this book, a nefarious plot, because where else is it better to be inspired about a demonic takeover of America than Washington, D.C.? There is no better place to get inspired to write such a thing. I'll, okay. just, I'll, I'll let you know, it's already happened. Yes. He's taken over. It's well, not, it, this is not prophecy. Well, when I wrote the, this book, is when I wrote the book eight years ago, this was like cutting edge. Now, <laughs> now you read it and it's cringe. Okay. But, yeah. uh, um, and so I, I, I wrote this book and, the, and, and Nefarious lays out names, names, connects dots walks you through the entire process of how he destroyed the country and and he and he publishes it in a book not like the you know the, the whiplashed you know, villain well now that i've got you captured let me share my plan not that kind of thing he needs to he needs to convince his master the devil that his plan has been successful so i don't know if you caught that and i don't quite know what to make of what he said but he makes a statement that he was in the shower and that he heard a voice in the back of his head that was saying these things to him and Driscoll asks him, do, do, do you think a demon told you this? And he says, well, I hope not. So at any rate, he gives this interview and he goes on a little bit later, about 15 minutes into the interview. I wanted to share this one other clip from there and then we're going to move on and talk more so about the movie. But here's something else he had to say about the about the film itself as he goes. All right. He gets trained, but in the ways in, in, that undo that wrecks him, he he learns, holy crap, everything, you know, that, that I mean one of the lines of the movie. I was wrong, he says at the end. I was wrong about everything. Yeah. And I think that's what will set the stage for then when you see the film. And when you, this is the one that you can show your unbelieving friends and family members. Our, our marketing, our trailer is fantastic. And, and that's the, it's the kind of film they'll look at it and say, wow, I want to see that. Yeah. And then it'll give them the message, just not in a way that you're accustomed to, that you want them to receive. But then you can't just leave that part of simple dangling. Take them out to coffee, take them out to pizza, take them out to dinner, ice cream afterwards. And now you get to have those conversations because we beg those questions in this film. Okay, so you can see here that uh, Steve Dace and the directors you will hear are presenting this film as something that's for unbelievers, first of all, that it is not a Christian film. They, they've said that several times. And that it is for unbelievers. Uh, one of the directors uh, in an interview, he said that it was like a Trojan horse, especially the poster. It's like a Trojan horse to bring in the uh, the pagan uh, unbelievers and to uh, spark conversations and to br to bring in the unbelieving family members and, and friends that you have. Again, there's there's some concerns I'm going to lead up to with this, but and you may be wondering why I have concerns and if do I not agree with some of the uh, premises of the the film, such as the stance on abortion, on marriage, on uh, gender and things. I'm I'm conservative and I do take the approach of a biblical stance on those, and so I do agree with the, the issues that are going on there. Having said that, there are, again, there are things that are going on within this film that I don't know if we've really considered, and I haven't heard a lot of people talking about this. So I wanted to switch gears now and talk about the film itself. Now, as I said, there are directors or two directors over this film, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Kozelman. 
And what you may not know about these these two individuals, these two men have made movies such as God's Not Dead. There are several of those that they directed Unplanned. Unplanned was the first film that they did, and what, right when they were getting ready to do Unplanned, um, they found out about Dace's book, Nefarious, The Nefarious Plot, and decided this was going to be their next film. You may hear in some of the clips that I play, they, um, or if you go and watch the actual uh, videos, which I'll provide the links to these so you can watch them just to, again, verify what I'm saying. But you'll hear them say that they came up against a lot of demonic attacks, is what they say, um, as far as making this film. And they talk about there were multiple car accidents that happened in a very short span. They talk about how the roof got ripped off the their building where they do their work. Uh, during a rainstorm, there were multiple different things that they talk about that happened to them while they were making this film. The concern that I'm going to raise, this is touted, even though they say it's not a Christian film, it's a horror film, it's still at the same time being touted as a Christian film. These two men are Roman Catholics, and they had a, a priest on the set in order to uh, to provide some spiritual guidance to them and such. And they, in one of the interviews, they even talk about there were voices coming out of the couch. And so in the room they were filming in and they had to bring the priest in to do an exorcism. There's a lot of things that, that happen in some of these interviews. And, and, I'm gonna, we're gonna li and we're gonna listen to some of these clips here in just a minute. But one of the concerns that I have is the promotion of ecumenicism, the, the uniting of different faiths together and saying that everybody's un lumped under one belief system rather than acknowledging that there are beliefs that are contradicting scripture. They're in violation of the final authority, which is scripture, the word of God, and ignoring the fact that we're, we're eliminating a mission field that really needs to hear the true gospel. So with that, I want to discuss uh, the, the film now regarding the directors and some of the underlying beliefs that you may or may not be aware of. And I was not aware of them until I did some further digging and research. Now, I want to play a couple of clips for you back to back. You're going to hear this first one. This was at the uh, premiere of the movie. This is one of the deliverance ministers. Her name is Taylor. And so she was invited to the premiere. Let's hear what she has to say. Because, and the reason why I'm playing this and I'm going to play a couple other clips from some of the Demon Slayers is because the next two gentlemen interviewed the directors for their YouTube channel and discussing the movie with them and some of the demonic things that they are claiming that took place that, that uh, were hindering them in the ability to film this movie. But I want you to hear what these men have to say as far as in, in regards to this, the filming of this movie, who is involved in it, and their stance on it theologically. Absolutely. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so passionate about deliverance ministry. That's what I do online um, and in person. And so it's just exciting to have movies coming out addressing this topic. It's a hot topic right now, and I think it needs to be addressed. I'm so glad the church is having this conversation. It's kind of a hot topic right now. And so uh, I definitely wanted to show my support and come out tonight. I just want to confess, when I first saw the movie poster, I did initially think it was a horror film. My Long Island campus is across the street from the Amityville Horror House. And, uh, you know, we see horror films come through on the regular. And I just simply thought that was it. But I thought to myself, after I found out that it's a movie about deliverance, a movie about exorcism, it's a movie about uh, the demonic realm and that demonic conversation that happens, I was pleasantly surprised because they said, man, it's about time as believers that we utilize wisdom and we put things in a package that disarms people who are not saved. You know, when you're fishing, you're going to you're going to always catch a fish that's in alignment with the lure that you're using. And so this is this is wisdom. This is the Bible says he who wins souls is wise. And so I actually believe of all the movies, listen, come out in Jesus name was pretty obvious. It was an incredible experience. Many people were saved and delivered. But I love the fact that God uh, put this movie together in such a way through Chuck and through Carrie that it would really disarm people who might have some resistance to it. Guys, I want you to be praying for Carrie and Chuck. I want you to be praying for this film. But more so than that, we don't just need prayers. The Bible says don't be hearers of the word, but also be doers. So I am asking you to mobilize. I started this video with this. I'm going to end with it. 
Get behind this thing. Let's fill up the movie theaters. I, yes, we saw deliverances happening and come out in Jesus' name, but I believe that the same thing can happen at the end of this movie. There's going to be people who are curious, people who just need somebody to step up and say, hey, this movie was more than fiction. This movie is real. That's why you felt what you felt. Can I pray for anybody? And I believe that this weekend we have another opportunity in the theaters uh, to, to evangelize and do the work of the Lord. Carrie and Chuck, I just want to sincerely thank you as brothers in Christ for your work. Um, man, it is so needed. C.S. Lewis was uh, a tremendous asset for the body of Christ, but I've been saying for years, we need we need others. And so you guys are carrying that mantle and running with it. So we honor you and thank you so, so much. This is one of the most theologically sound movies that you will go and see as a Christian. I have in my past read, when I was younger, a book called He Came to Set the Captives Free, which is a woman's story of delivering, you know, alleged uh, or uh, a woman who was dedicated to Satan as his wife. Um, and it was pretty, pretty scary, even though it's based on the true story. And so um, kind of brought some fear into my life and that, that um, yeah, I didn't read any more deliverance books after that in the evening for a while. So this is, I don't think this is one of those films, but at the same time, this is definitely a very strong, bold, um, direct film. It deals with, addresses stuff with, about open doors to demons that's so spot on, um, about, you know, things that are, we're seeing in the culture today that are actually demonic. Um, it does address the issue of the cross, and so I'm not going to do any spoilers, but it's made by Christians. Um, but it was made for non-Christians. So I'm, I'm going to say it again. It was made by Christians for non-Christians. And Christians who are theologically sound, they had people from Catholics to Protestants to, you know, very conservative Baptist pastors, very known pastors, go and watch it. And they really endorsed it and said, we're bringing our, our, our church there. We're going to invite everybody there. I almost feel like this film, and one of the producers said, they said, this film is like two plus two. We don't tell you that it's four, but you have to answer that question. We, we challenge you with that question. And it's very obvious, very obvious throughout the film about Jesus, about God, about the cross, about abortion, about you know, open doors, all of the stuff. It's very obvious of the Christian values and the Christian truth that shines in there. So I will share the links to all of these so that you can hear them in context if you would like to hear them. And just to be fair in, in that respect, but you can hear that there are proponents of this in the deliverance ministry, for example, in the modern deliverance ministry. Now, Bob Larson, um, if you listen to his review of this film and you're familiar with Bob Larson, he also runs in the same vein as these others of the demon slayers, the ones that, that believe that they're demon slayers. And he actually gave it some thumbs down um, because of its portrayal. You just have this different viewpoint based on these deliverance ministries. But again, my main concern, along with the fact, of course, that you now have deliverance ministries that are um, pushing this and they're endorsing it. But there is a more serious issue that's going on here that we'll talk about with the ecumenism. Now, I mentioned the directors a little bit ago, and this is not to, to personally attack them or anything. It's just to to present you with the information at hand because you may not know this. Both of the directors, as I said, are Roman Catholics, and I did verify that by looking at an interview that they did. And um, I'm going to play, again, several other clips in addition to this one, but as we go, but uh, I did find this interview because I, I started wondering, well, what do they believe? And the reason why I wondered that was because of the interview they did with Mike Signorelli, where they mentioned that they had a, 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 a Catholic priest there and that he did an exorcism in the room and and the the right of place. And I thought, hmm, that seems odd to me that they would do that. Why would they have a, a Catholic priest there? What's their belief? So I found this interview that I wanted to play for them so you can hear their in their own words about them coming to the Catholic faith or returning to the Catholic faith. One of them returned. So let's hear that for just a moment and then we'll continue on down this rabbit hole of what I'm wanted, wanting to talk to you guys about regarding this film. Carrie, you didn't grow up Catholic, right? Uh, what was the clincher that brought you into the church and how has it affected the work you do in the motion picture industry? Well, uh, 
No, my, my dad was Jewish, my mom was Protestant, and I was confused. <laughs> uh, they said, do you want to go to uh, church, do you want to go to temple, or do you want to play with your friends? This is when I was nine years old. So I made the, the obvious choice, so, I think I'll play with my friends. Um, but no, it, you know, Chuck had been secretly praying for me for a long time. And uh, when you go into the movie business, it's such a brutal business that you get, at some point, broken. And, you know, the Lord enters through a broken heart. And that's exactly what happened. He then just lifted us up, lifted me up. And I just knew, I said, this is it. I mean, being a Catholic is the proudest thing that I, the uh, best thing I've ever done. And uh, without that, we would not be successful. We would not be doing what we're doing now. So easily the best thing that we ever did. Now, but, Chuck, Chuck, you're a revert, as I understand. What, what uh, precipitated you coming back to the church? Pretty much uh, when we came into the industry, you know, I was about 30 years old and figured it was time to stop rebelling against my parents. And uh, if you move to California, you know, it's a different <laughs> climate, different atmosphere here. Uh, sin is much more visible and you, you find yourself having to make a choice. You can't just sort of uh, coast along in life and just, you know, you, you're either going to find yourself moving in one direction or the other. So I decided that it was time to find the right way. Now, you may wonder what the big deal is in me bringing this out of saying both of these gentlemen are Roman Catholics and this movie is is being promoted as a Christian film. And you may think, well, that surely that their religious beliefs didn't affect this film. I mean, that's possible, right? Um, well, I, I want to play this for you real quick and then we're going to I'm going to read some stuff to you and then we're going to play some more clips later um, to again express the concerns. But I wanted to uh, play this very short one for you. This is from a gentleman named Keith Nestor. Apparently he was a Protestant that is now converted to Catholicism and he and he recently did a review of the movie Nefarious. And I listened to his review. I want you to hear what he says about six minutes in that caught my attention and got me going even further down this rabbit hole of looking to see, are there Roman Catholic beliefs in this movie that maybe people aren't aware of? And why is that a problem for the Protestant? So you may not be in for a fun night, although I will say as a Catholic, there was nothing in this film that blasphemed our faith. And in fact, there were certain elements of the film very consistent with Catholicism. Some things that were said, I went, wow, that's pretty Catholic. Well, that's an interesting remark. <laughs> and he never went into detail as to what those things were. He never expounded on what the specifics were in the film that he immediately was like, oh, that's that's pretty Catholic. So I started going on a search for myself. And I'm going to take you along with me on that search and share these things with you. And there's some things that are disturbing <laughs> that I found, to say the least. Now, there's several articles, and I'm going to share the links to these. The first article I wanted to present to you came from a website called FamilyLeader.com. They had an article posted uh, April 6, 2023, titled Exclusive Video Filmmaker Says New Horror Movie Will Spark Gospel Discussions. And in this, they were talking to Steve Dace, who again wrote the book, The Nefarious Plot. And he uh, reiterates that the nefarious movie uh, wasn't written for Christian audiences. It is a contemporary thriller and R-rated film with a poster and marketing campaign targeting fans of horror movies. And he explains that it isn't just a scary movie. It is a deliberate conversation starter. Some will see it as the kind of film to invite non-believing friends to watch in order to follow up with a discussion about the merciless reality of evil, our need for a savior, and Jesus' victory on the cross. And so that's Steve Dace's perspective on it. The next article I wanted to share with you came from the website called National Catholic Register. And I stumbled across this. This was an article that was posted April 17th of this year. And this article is basically a, a transcription, if you will, of an interview between the author of the um, article and the co-directors and the co-writers, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Konzelman. And so the dialogue is going back and forth. And I'm just going to share some of this with you as I scroll through. Um, they both directors, both the gentlemen, um, reiterate again, this is a thriller, that it is not a Christian film, that um, it is to uh, to shed light on the, the good and evil and the demon nefarious that's working through this, the character in the film. It's designed for people that are 
participating in such things as Ouija boards, tarot cards, uh, Reiki, yoga, getting pagan tattoos. All these are ways that people are getting infested. They say, if you play with the devil, he will come. All the world is surrounded by the occult, especially on TV and in the movie theaters. So it's a perfect time for this to show the wickedness and the evil of the devil. This was according to Mr. Solomon. When they're asked about the unusual problems, they talk about that in the, in the making of the film and the different uh, hurdles that they had about the onset priest that uh, had his appendix uh, almost burst and, and die. And and they go on to respond to the interviewer when, when he says, you really expose Satan and his tactics in the movie. They say, we drag him from the darkness and bring him into the light because we show that he's real. He's got a plan. He's initiating that plan. If we go back to the Bible, what does it say? There will come a time when good is considered bad and bad is considered good. We know that scripture does say that. They continue to go on to talk about how Catholics have to go see the movie, because, according to Solomon, because, quote, we need to get a refresher course on the devil. We need to realize that the devil is real. If you really, truly believe in the devil, you will change your life because you will suddenly realize somebody is after my soul. If I lose this battle, where do I go? Yes, the devil is most certainly real, and you don't need a movie to convince you of that. I mean, you can look around in society and, and realize and recognize, yes, the evil most certainly exists and the demons and the devil is real and demons are real and scripture tells us this so that's our final authority for one thing but we don't need to make sure that we truly believe in the devil we need to make sure that we truly believe in christ and i know that there's this argument that's been made in the interviews that have been done with this and uh, you know that fine line between exalting the devil and trying to uh, point out the the evidence of of the demonic um, it seemed like that sin was not really being addressed. And maybe I missed that. Uh, but it really seemed like there was a, <laughs> ironically enough, there was just this massive focus on the, the devil. And when, and when some things are said like this, and you're negating the fact that we live in a world because of sin that ultimately came because of rebellion, of man's rebellion against God by listening to Satan. And you're ignoring that uh, when we we have a responsibility um, in that because of the of sin, then that seems that seems to be problematic. Um, so they mentioned that, but I wanted to go down here a little bit more because they say a few times in this interview, this movie is a Catholic movie. Um, and the interviewer says, "There's no doubt this film speaks from the Catholic perspective, a Catholic film," and. Conselman says, deeply Catholic. Here's the surprise for us, though. We have shown this to a number of pastors and a number of theologians all across the Christian spectrum, and they agree with everything that's in there. That came almost as a shock to us. They're all dealing with the same problem. They all recognize this as the face of the adversary that they're up against, and, there's, and no one's voiced any questions or problems with the theology. And Solomon stated in the interview, I think the Lord anointed the movie. The Bible says, when you judge a man, look at the fruit of his tree. I would ask people, by the way, Chuck and I are devout Catholics. We love the Lord. We love the Blessed Virgin. We love our saints. We have a priest on set with us every movie. If you look at the fruit of our tree, you'll see. As they go on, there was one more part I wanted to read to you that uh, took me further down the rabbit hole, <laughs> if you will. They um, talked about how it is, is it this movie different from other exorcism movies? And Solomon says, everything about this movie is Catholic. It's an exorcism film, number one. And he said, we use Anne Catherine Emmerich's visions. We talk about creation. We talk about good and evil. We talk about how the devil was thrown out. Konzelman says, a lot of our audiences of post-Christian age in the United States have ne had never heard this before. Solomon went on right, right after this to say, we talk about the views and values of the church, no euthanasia, no abortion, no murder. It's a totally Catholic story. And as we're very excited about it, because we've wanted to make Catholic movies for a long, long time, our goal is to bring out as many Catholic movies as possible. We're very excited to see what the Lord does with it, especially since he's the one who told us to do it. And at the end of this interview, there was an interview that the uh, interviewer did with a priest. Uh, Father Martins was his name, and he is an exorcist recognized by the Vatican. He said that he could say without hesitation 
Quote, that it is the best movie portraying demonic possession ever produced. Rather than getting bogged down like every other movie in diabolical phenomena and power, such as levitation, extraordinary strength, and other same old signs, this one brings the viewer into the demonic mind. While the movie trend has focused on displaying demonic rage, Nefarious deftly exhibits the devil's insatiable craving and formidable intelligence. Far less concerned with ostentation than demonstrating the devil's thought and intellectual character, the movie accurately depicts how he smothers his victim's hope. And so he endorses this movie uh, because it's clean and it, it's, again, a good representation, as we've heard from also from from those in the modern deliverance movement, that this is an accurate uh, representation. So they would agree with the Roman Catholic Church on this. That was interesting to me. Now, I wanted to uh, go on because the name Anne Catherine Emmerich, I had no idea who that was. And so I looked that up because I thought, who is this? And... Um, what I found was uh, equally interesting, to say the least. Now, if you're not familiar with who Anne Catherine Emmerich is, let me shed some light here for you and read from an actual website that's devoted to Anne Catherine Emmerich that is um, recorded some of her journal entries and some of the things that she wrote, the set of volumes that she wrote. Now, she was known as a Christian mystic. Um, she was an Augustinian nun that lived in 17, from 1774 to 1824, and she is one of the great Catholic mystics of the last centuries, according to this website. Um, since her earliest childhood, she was a soul of exceptional kindness, devotion, and purity. Her life and her legacy will enlighten for centuries Christianity and all mankind. As you go on in the synopsis, it continues to share how from, from a yet very young age that she, um, from the age of six, that she got these extremely detailed visions. They were based on what the scripture had to say. It, it went beyond scripture. So these were extra biblical revelatory visions that she was getting. And the, the church holds her in high esteem because of these. And then there's volumes written on the things that she said. And I really found this interesting um, and more, and it just became more concerning and more disturbing as I went. So on the synopsis under the heading light on the figure of Jesus and his message, the website said this, many of us who have come to know about the existence of Anne Catherine Emmerich have done so through Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of the Christ. This film, excellent and inspired, includes in its script part of the visions of Anne Catherine, not included in the Gospels, which help us to better understand what happened, how, and why. And these flashes of truth that are reflected in the film pale when we read the complete story, not only of the passion of the Lord, but of the whole life of Jesus, of the Holy Family, and of many other spiritual personalities described in the New and the Old Testament. Near the end of this synopsis, it goes on to say, The visions of Anne Catherine have a capacity to make Christianity understandable, and a potential for renewal and intimate approach to the message of Jesus, which is difficult to find an event of such significance in recent centuries. It is now up to each one of us to make the small effort to get closer and know his message. The story of the visions of Anne Catherine is an immeasurable spiritual treasure, our debt of gratitude to her too. Let us show our affection accordingly. And it looks like they have um, a photo at the bottom of the synopsis of her tomb where, where people can go honor her. So, uh, they have the list of the volumes, the complete visions that here on this website. And I just want to read to you because uh, one of the directors admitted that they used her visions in order to contribute to this film. So the character that's playing Nefarious, that's a demon possessed serial killer. His character is based um, on the things that he says. They wrote the script based on some of her visions. Now, does that sound theologically sound? <laughs> because the, the more I keep looking at this stuff, y'all, the more I keep seeing new apostolic reformation in this. I mean, the more I just I just see the bleed over into that, not in, including like the, the apostolic, uh, the, the uh, apostolic authority that we see that's that's. Uh, proposed and espoused in, in that movement but you see you're seeing mysticism here you're seeing this ecumenical call we see this in the new apostolic reformation just as a side note here i'm taking a rabbit trail out of the rabbit hole for a minute but you'll see this i mean you'll see key leaders in the new apostolic reformation calling for unity todd white you can find clips of him doing that lou engel you see shayon i believe that the catholic church and the christian church we're going to come together right now. 
Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for a mighty baptism on the Catholic Church, God. Jesus' name. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Stretch out your hands, guys, right now. I just want you to pray over everybody here. Sure. Lift up your hands, guys. Come on. <sighs> Heavenly Father, as Lou Engel taught us, we need to fly united. The Vatican says that the ecumenical dialogue serves to transform modes of thought and behavior of their communities, and they're talking about Protestant churches, so that they can prepare the way for the unity of faith as the obstacles to perfect communion are overcome all Christians will be gathered in a common celebration of the Eucharist. Evangelical leaders are dimming the light of the gospel. Consider Hugh Latimer's last words to his companion as they were being burned at the stake. He said, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace as I trust shall never be put out. My dear brothers, this light is dimming. It's being put out by the statements evangelicals are making today. Well, the Reformation can never be reversed because there is a wide chasm that separates us on the essentials of the gospel, on how one is born again, on how one is justified, on how one is purified of sin. We are separated on who can mediate between God and man and we are distinctly separated on the efficacy, the sufficiency, and the necessity of Jesus Christ. There can never be unity with Rome. We must stand on the truth and be sanctified by the truth. You know what we're lacking according to Rome? We don't have the Eucharist, the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. And each time a Roman Catholic priest offers that for the fullness of salvation. I will tell him, in Christ, I already have the complete forgiveness of sin, and according to your catechism, you don't. In Christ, I have the assurance of eternal life. You see Chris Vallotton, that Chris Vallotton met with the Pope several years ago, and, and he shared about how he liked the Pope, and the Pope was wanting to have the prophets back um, when they had their meetings, and they, and Mike Bickle asked a question while he was there, and it was a very vague question that really um, made it seem like that he was um, orthodox in his understanding of faith in Jesus Christ. And we got the privilege of meeting with Pope Francis. It was probably one of the highlights of my life. He was funny, warm, and very spiritual. I was, was invited along with several other pastors to a small connect forum with Pope Francis because he has a deep passion for the unity among believers. And I do mean deep passion. We spent about two hours asking him questions about whatever was on our hearts. His opening comments blessed me. He said, we must invite the prophets back into the church and welcome them with open arms. That was his very first comment. And a, and a bunch of us, a bunch of people looked over at Stacy and I am like, we're, we're good. We like this Pope a lot. <laughs> you know, there's different different things in that that the, again the mysticism that they appeal to extra biblical revelation as authoritative and that's what's going on by the way with Anne Catherine Emmerich when people are appealing to this and they're they're placing it on par with the revelation from scripture from the word of god that is that we know is the word of god that again is a, a cause for concern and um the the deliverance ministry in in and of itself there the appeal to the visions it, this is all hearkening back to again the new apostolic reformation and maybe that's why it it bothers me so much when i'm looking at it because i see such a parallel between the two but i wanted to read some of this to you because it is quite concerning when when some of the things that she said now uh in the uh volume 1 that is of the old testament when you go to part one that talks about creation and the fall of the angels 
and uh, the creation of Adam and Eve. I wanted to read some of these things to you. And she goes in great detail. So there's no way. I mean, she's talking about seeing orbs and light and radiation. And uh, she's she's talking about seeing the, the demons fall and the creation of Adam and Eve themselves. But I wanted to read this to you uh, regarding Adam and what she had to say when he was created. Just to give you some examples of things that she said, but there's 12 volumes here that go into great detail about lots of different things that she gives that as if she's seeing all of this for herself, she was given this special revelation. No one else was given this and she wrote it down from even from a young age. She said, I saw Adam created not in paradise, but in the region in which Jerusalem was subsequently situated. I saw him come forth glittering and white from a mound of yellow earth as if out of a mold. The sun was shining and I thought in parentheses, she says, I was only a child when I saw it, that the sunbeams drew Adam out of the hillock. He was, as it were, born of the virgin earth. God blessed the earth and it became his mother. He did not instantly step forth from the earth. Some time elapsed before his appearance. He lay in the hillock on his left side, his arm thrown over his head, a light vapor covering him as with a veil. I saw a figure in his right side, and I became conscious that it was Eve, and that she would be drawn from him in paradise by God. God called him. The hillock opened, and Adam stepped gently forth. There were no trees around, only little flowers. I had seen the animals also coming forth from the earth in pure singleness, the females separate from the males. In another part of this, she uh, mentions about during the crucifixion of Christ and in the, in the making of Adam in the, in this part, I wanted to read this to you as well. She said, I have always thought that by the wounds of Jesus, there were opened anew in the human body portals closed by Adam's sin. I have been given to understand that Longinus opened in Jesus' side, the gate of regeneration to eternal life. Therefore, no one entered heaven while that gate was closed. And you may be wondering who Longinus is or, or, or what that is. I had to look that up. Longinus is actually said to be the name of the unnamed Roman soldier who pierced the side of Jesus. And his name actually appears in the apocryphal gospel of Nicodemus. So just so you know that. So when she says that Longinus opened in Jesus' side the gate of regeneration to eternal life, that is the, the Roman soldier that pierced the side of Jesus and blood and water came out. Medically speaking, uh, many people will uh, ascertain that, that he actually pierced the pericardium, which is the sac around the heart, and that there was a pericardial effusion in there. When you talk, when you actually look about what the, the horrifically happens in crucifixion to the body. So there you have it. I mean, th these are some of the things, again, she's a Christian mystic. Um, this is where they're getting their information from. And, um, but this movie is, to, is supposed to be doctrinally sound. And yet we have the directors appealing to extra biblical visions in order to get the information. And really it is, even though the, you know, there's a, a statement, their statements made of, you know, we're not trying to focus on the devil, but the devil's being focused upon. Um, I don't know if the gospel is actually presented in this. I know at the end of the movie, there is a, a short little dialogue with the psychiatrist in the, in the movie, the, the actor that plays the psychiatrist, and he's being interviewed by Glenn Beck, and Glenn Beck is a Mormon. So we have another aspect there of presenting another uh, area of religious faith. And again, that's why I, when I take all this into consideration, just as someone who's, a, who's looking in on this, it just seems like that there's this ecumenical drive let's all unite we're, we're all saying the name of jesus so we're all believing the same thing so let's all unite but are we are we all believing the same thing um the directors state that there are conversions from the movie and that the film is designed to cause discussions with unbelieving family and friends but uh, my question is which gospel is presented because it's not the same gospel the roman catholic gospel is not the same gospel as the the protestant gospel as the as the biblical gospel that we see and the understanding of uh, salvation justification uh, faith alone in christ alone that, that your none of your works can save you there that you can't uh, depend upon your works um, in order to save you and there's so many different areas of roman catholic belief and that's far better handled by someone who was actually part of the roman catholic faith which 
leads me to segue into presenting to someone to you someone who you may or may not be familiar with. His name is Mike Gendron. And I'm also going to share some of the links to his information as well. He has a ministry that he does that he ministers to Roman Catholics to share the gospel with them because he believes that Roman Catholics are not saved. Um, that there are uh, many people that are lost and they're deceived in in this false gospel. And I would agree with him. And it, and when we call for uh, unity in this ecumenical call, then we are basically uh, denying the ability to minister to people that really need need to hear the true gospel that are believing something that's completely false and it and it denies the authority of scripture and it denies the true gospel. So I wanted to play a couple of clips for you and I'm going to also provide some additional links for you in the description below that I would encourage you to to watch. I think that will be very helpful, especially if you're not super familiar with the Roman Catholic faith and what they believe. And that you may have heard people that are Roman Catholic and they'll say, well, you know, we're, we're Orthodox and we believe the same thing. And, you know, the, the Reformation was a huge mistake. And I've heard people in the New Apostolic Reformation write that and state those things that, well, they agree with it to a certain point, but it just went too far. Or they don't agree with the, the separation. At any rate, um, I think it's important that we address things like this, even when we're talking about such things as movies and shows. The Chosen is a whole other issue, and I have not talked about that except uh, about a year ago. I, I did a, a Facebook Live on that. But um, I have serious concern about The Chosen, and I have for quite some time, and that's why I don't watch it. Um, because, again, one of the things I'm concerned about is this ecumenical call to unite in a false unity. I, I don't agree with it. Um, I think that uh, any time that you say that you're representing something theologically or that you're representing Christ, that uh, doctrine matters. And so, um, you know, if we're going to say we're ministering the gospel, we need to make sure that's the right gospel, that it's not another gospel um, that's leading people astray that Paul warned about in, in the book of Galatians, um, that he warned the Corinthians about um, tolerating another gospel in 2 Corinthians 11, that we are ministering the gospel in accordance with scripture, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so with that, let me play one or two clips for you regarding uh, Roman Catholicism based on what Mike Gendron, who was a former Roman Catholic, he was part of the Roman Catholic Church 30 or th to 35 years. Um, he and his wife now minister to others and to share the gospel with them and to uh, share the truth with, with Roman Catholics and to call them to saving faith in Christ alone. So let's share this first one so you can hear. This is from Redeeming Truth, uh, the ministry in Arizona. They did an interview with Mike Gendron and hear one of the things that he says regarding Roman Catholicism. Yeah, that describes the Catholic Church very well. The Roman Catholics are utterly dependent upon their priest. They are a mediator of God's grace. And it starts off with priests has, have to baptize Roman Catholics for regeneration and justification. And after that, the priest hears their confession and absolves their sin after they do penance. And then the priest offers the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist. And that's literally the body and blood of Jesus through the miracle of transubstantiation. And then it's the priest who imparts the Holy Spirit during the sacrament of confirmation. It's also the priest that gives last rites to Catholics on their deathbed. But even after a Catholic dies, they're still utterly dependent upon their priesthood because it's the priest who will then offer the sacrifice of the Mass to get them out of purgatory more expeditiously. But he refuses to do so unless indulgences are purchased. And so normally what happens is the family of the deceased will go to the priest and purchase mass cards, they'll put the name of their Catholic loved one on the mass card, return it to the priest with a stipend of money or an offering, and the priest will lay it on the altar, and the mass, the sacrifice of the Eucharist of Christ, is supposed to reduce time in purgatory for the name of the person on the card. And so no priest can tell the Catholic family how many masses must be said, and so Catholics are in bondage to religious deception not only in this life, but also in the next life, because they're still utterly dependent upon the priesthood. But I need to also share with you that 
it's not only the priests that Roman Catholics are dependent upon, they're also dependent upon Mary. Because in paragraph 494 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that without a single sin to restrain her, she became the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. And as mediatrix, she did not lay aside the saving office, but by her manifold intercession, continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. And so Catholics believe that the grace of God must flow through the hands of Mary, through the priest, into the sacraments, and then the Catholic will receive saving grace. So it's a very complex system, but it's not uh, biblical, as we know. There's only one mediator, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this next clip I'm going to play is from the same interview. It's a little later on. And uh, I, I'd encourage you to listen to this one. It's got timestamps on it. It's really helpful. It's episode 100 from Redeemer Bible Church. It's Catholicism versus the Bible with Mike Gendron. And it was done three months ago, so it's fairly current. But there is one point where he talks about the ecumenicism and the false Christ regarding Roman Catholicism. Listen to what he has to say on this matter. I was just going to say, going off of what you said earlier, this John 17 page, and, and it's so important, the reason we want to talk about this is the very nature of deception and the nature of understanding the use of language, because it says here, the, the, uh, in honoring the prayer of Jesus, we exist to inspire, develop, and display love and unity among all those who profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Now, I, I think the crux of it comes down to what does it mean to profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and how do we define that, you know, for lack of a better word, theologically in, in our practice, right? I mean, it, you mentioned what part does light have with darkness and what part does truth have with error? Uh, how can we combine the, they're, you know, they're, they're purporting to do something good here. We want to bring everyone together. And if I profess Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I should be able to fellowship with everyone else who does the same thing, Right. And that's kind of the yes, hypothetical have, question posed. Yeah, Kyle, we have to recognize that Paul said some will come and preach another Jesus, and the Roman Catholic Jesus is another Jesus. Mm. He's a counterfeit. He's a false Christ. He did not satisfy divine justice. He does not provide direct access to God. That's why you have priests as a mediator between mm. Catholics and God. You know, one of the miracles that took place when Christ gave up his spirit the veil separating the Holy of Holies from sinful man was torn open from top to bottom, showing that now through faith in the shed blood of Jesus, we have direct access to the Father through the Son. We no longer need sacerdotal priests offering the same sacrifice that can never take away sin. The Catholic Jesus did not make believers perfect forever. Mm. He did not secure salvation, and he did not finish the work of redemption. So we have to make sure we are looking at the true Jesus versus the counterfeit Jesus because we cannot have unity with a false Christ. Again, the whole interview is very insightful, and I encourage you to listen to it. But one last clip when talking about Roman Catholicism and the false gospel. That's, that's in, it's incredibly grave, um, the way that the Scripture contrasts with the Roman Catholic Church and it just seems that Protestants today don't want to draw sharp lines. They don't want to color with black and white. Uh, they're they're incredibly afraid to be considered a fundamentalist in these ways. But the reason that you do it, the reason that we 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 love your ministry and want to expose you more to our church is because Catholics are the mission field. They're not, they're, they're not separated brothers and sisters. They're, they're, they're the mission field because there's a false Christ, because there's a false authority, and because there is a false gospel, correct? Correct. And a false view of sin and a false view of Mary in a different path to eternity. That's the ultimate result of all these deceptions. They're on the wide road that leads to destruction and the only way they'll ever seek to be on the narrow road is for us to point out that they are on the wide road. And we do that lovingly, compassionately, showing scripture after scripture that refutes all of their ungodly traditions and dogmas. So let's you know, say we also have to remember that the reformers died for the defense of the gospel. They were brutally murdered. They were brutally tortured and burned at the stake 
because they would not bow their knee to Rome. Rome had so many put to death because of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to recognize that and encourage evangelicals not to compromise the gospel because there was a great price the reformers paid to make the gospel intact and exclusive for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Again, I will share the links to those below along with um, a few other links to videos that I think will be helpful for you uh, regarding Mike Gendron's ministry and that you can listen to that are very insightful. Um, but before we end our time today, I just wanted to reiterate again, not attacking anyone in general or trying to be malicious anyway, but just genuinely concerned. Um, and I'm not against, you know, having movies and things that are certainly going to um, shed light on the truth and, and, and be thought provoking. It's, it's not that in and of itself. But when we have this, um, this undercurrent of um, unbiblical beliefs, another gospel being presented, um, confusion with that, and, and there's not a clear message, or it, maybe it's more of a political message, and rather than f flat out presenting the gospel and wanting to cater to the culture, rather than present what scripture has to say and not realizing and or being satisfied with the sufficiency of scripture, when we're wanting to um, cater to the world. Um, and and I'm, again, I'm not saying that's what they're trying to do, but there are uh, outlets out there that will do that in order to get their point across. There, there can be danger in that because then there's compromise. And my concern is, again, I go back to the, the main things I've already stated already, and I'll just state them again in case anybody missed them, is for one thing, you have people who are professing Christians endorsing the Roman Catholics view of deliverance and also calling Roman Catholics brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, the second one is the ecumenical call. And again, this has been seen in the New Apostolic Reformation, Word of Faith. I mean, Kenneth Copeland's another one. He he did a, a tongues years ago that he, he claimed to have a prayer language in tongues that he was stating for the Pope because the Pope was asking for prayer. I mean, there's different things that have gone on, um, and I don't know what their, uh, other than their affiliations, I don't know how far their relationship goes um, and what their beliefs are. But when you're, when you're um, standing on platforms at like the Azusa now or um, in other areas and other churches, and you're saying we need to, you know, unite back with the Roman Catholic Church, mm. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no to that because that's false unity. We see mysticism being used here. Again, you heard the directors uh, in the interview that I, that I read to you, the transcription, that they they admitted this lady and Catherine um, Emmerich was an influence on the, the writing of their film. And so a mysticism is, is in, an influence here. It's a contributor, extra biblical revelation, extra biblical visions. And, and the similarity with the uh, focus on deliverance ministry, on mysticism, extra biblical visions, um, hearing God, uh, this is all tr attributed and tied to, again, you can see the, the, and the ecumenical call. It all goes back and filters back. Uh, you can see the, the parallels with the New Apostolic Reformation. It's not to say that watching a film that you can't, uh, if the gospel's truly presented, that you can't become, that God couldn't uh, soften your heart and that you wouldn't be convicted of your sin and that you would repent and come to saving faith in Christ. I believe that God could use those things, but the gospel has to be presented. That's where people are saved is the preaching of the gospel. Romans ten seventeen, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God or the word of Christ. And in the context of Romans 10, when you read it, it it's talking about the gospel being ministered. Um, and when these conversations occur, such as what the directors are saying or Steve Dace is saying or whoever, you know, people don't need to focus on the devil. They need to realize that Satan is real, most certainly. But even more so, the focus needs to go back on Christ. Uh, and, and the truth needs to be proclaimed that people who are lost need to hear they are at enmity with God. This is not a focus on Satan being the big bad wolf and being the one in the world that's doing everything, even though we know he exists. People must take accountability and we will all be held, we are all held accountable. Unbelievers need to hear the truth that they are at enmity with God. 
and that they need to be taken back to Scripture. The Word of God is revealing the truth of God. That's what we go back to. That's what we appeal to. And we and I would just encourage you that uh, believers in Christ, our final authority is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's not our experiences. It's not how we feel. It's not the burning in the bosom. It's not... Um, a, a dream or a vision or anything else like that. It's not someone else's mystical experiences that we appeal to. And then we say, well, they're not on par with scripture, but we, we hold them in high esteem like we do scripture and, and, and using these different elements in order to almost seem as if the gospel is not sufficient in and of itself to be powerful enough to save people when we know that it is the Romans 1 16 17 I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and then the Greek we know that the word of God is powerful it is alive and God is the one who saves people and he gives us the great opportunity and privilege to be able to share the truth with others and that's what we need to do and part of the truth is we need not unite under false unity that is not united under the true gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, what we're supposed to do is we share the truth in love. And the truth comes from the word of God that we know is the word of God. And so I, I just wanted to talk about this today, present you with some things. Obviously, this is not, as, as always, this is not an exhaustive <laughs> episode there's no way for me to cover any every every little detail every little jot and tittle about about this particular topic this is to to shed some light from a perspective of of what i've been able to uh, to find and to give you something to think about and just because something seems popular doesn't mean that it's from god just because you have attack or you have you face difficulty trying to get something done doesn't mean it's the devil fighting you. There's just different elements of this to consider. And th at the end of the day, we have to come back to the true gospel of Jesus Christ because that matters. And there are things in the Roman Catholic Church and there are things in the Mormon Church that do not agree with sound biblical teaching. And that is said in love and it's said in kindness and gentleness because we want to see people come to saving faith in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that comes the preaching of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, de the death in, in the, for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that he was buried and he rose from the dead three days later in accordance with Scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. So I would encourage you, please go back to the Word of God and listen to these videos. Um, if, if you have questions about Roman Catholicism or you, you have concerns of a family member or how to present these things or you want to understand better about the Roman Catholic faith because of loved ones or friends and, and you want to um, understand biblically how to respond to these things, listen to these videos. I think that they'll be very helpful to you. I appreciate you taking time out to listen to the episode today as always. And if you have questions or want to reach out to me, you feel free to email me at dawn at lovesickscribe.com. And if you've enjoyed this podcast or you found it helpful, um, consider leaving a five-star review and it so can help others find it. And as always, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.